Meanwhile, the Nigerian Army, under the leadership of Lieutenant General Tukur Buratai, Chief of Army Staff, has removed General Olushegun Adeniyi, who appeared in that viral video, urging military authorities to supply them with weapons and accurate intelligence to combat Boko Haram terrorists in the northeast region. Adeniyi, who is theater commander of Operation Lapia Adoli, in the viral video, lamented how his men were outgunned and ambushed while on an operation. The director of Army Public Relations, Saigiru said in a statement that Major General Lushagun Adeniyi was taken from command of the military operation and redeployed to an Army Research Institute. He said the move was approved by the Chief of Army Staff Tukur Buratai as a routine and normal exercise for greater professional effectiveness and efficiency. Adeni was replaced by an Army Division Commander in the Northwest, Major General Farouk Yahaya. Over 20 other generals and the colonel were also affected in the exercise. And joining us live via Skype is retired Air Vice Marshal Femi Badebo uh, to share more lights on this. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Gwadibo. Good morning. And good to have you. I'm sure you've seen, like we did, the videos uh, with General Adeni reporting on the state, sad state of affairs in the field. What do you make of it? Um, the first time I saw it, I was quite disturbed. Um, I've had to look at it a couple of times again. And yes, he was uh, respectful. He was quite courteous in um, the way he passed the information, but you could see that he was agitated. Uh, it was in the heat of battle, and that definitely was not the right channel of communication. As a field commander, he would have uh, unrestricted access to his boss, who is the chief of army staff, or the chief of defense staff, whoever he wanted to talk to at that time. And um, he had a briefing room and he had an ops room. Those are the places where he could have, um, after take, calming down from the heat of the battle and taking the proper statistics, uh, passed the information. There was too much information in that video. And uh, the chances was that he was, like I said, acting in the heat of battle, which is not the way communication should have been handled. Now, shortly after this uh, video, we hear now that uh, he's been reposted or redeployed rather to a research institute. Should we be suspicious of this move? Um, there's nothing suspicious about the move. Um, there, there obviously is a problem. And the problem needed to be nipped in the bud. Like I said, in the day, today's, uh, the way social media moves these days, even if he was just uh, shooting that video to use later, uh, it was not the best form of communication. Um, uh, even, you know, I, I think there, there is something that the Nigerian army needs to get right. And that is what we call radio silence when we are planning uh, a serious operation or while we're in the course of that operation, which would mean that everybody would turn off um, their, their means of communication, so to speak. And um, now that everybody seems to have a mobile phone and uh, in a position to shoot videos and send out videos, uh, there are certain places where a, co a commander should actually order that all uh, such equipment should be uh, put off or seized for a period until after the operation had taken place. And mind you, every uh, commander from, uh, even, the, even from a, a brigade commander now has an information officer. And the information's sole responsibility is to dissect the available information and pass it on to the press in a well-articulated manner. Okay. And so it definitely is not part of what I know was being taught at Jaji or at Defence College as regards passing on sensitive information.
Apparently, Jala, uh, Adeni's uh, re redeployment is as plain as, if I use the words of you know, the Nigerian Army spokesman, Sagir Musa, that the new posting was a routine exercise that is intended to reinvigorate the system for greater professional effectiveness and efficiency. What do you think? Everything done by the overall commander, um, who would be the chief of army staff, working on the chief of defense staff, um, would be in the best interest of the operation that is being carried on. There is a lot of information that is not available to you and me as to the goings on in that field of battle. But like I said, for uh, a commander to pass such sensitive information by by a means that could be in intercepted by anybody, including the enemy, uh, and even some of his troops who uh, have other intentions, there is a breakdown in communications. And like I said, the, the, um, the way the officer was speaking uh, showed that, yes, he was agitated. Yes, he was trying to calm the soldier who was uh crying and stuff like that but he himself should not have addressed his commander from that uh position okay. and so there was a need to ask yourself is he losing it because if he loses it then the, the, the then the whole battle will be compromised okay. and so in his best interest and the interest of the general um, you know, manpower of that operation, um, those at the top felt it was best to take him out. All right. Well, if we look at uh, the human part of this whole experience, uh, much as you talk about the sensitivity of the matter and the manner in which the information was given, should we not again treat this as a welcome development, you know, having to get insight, get uh, to see the conditions of our soldiers, you know, those who lay their lives for the others, so to speak? Yes, these are risks. These are some of the things that, uh, um, you know, sometimes a commander has to take. And the repercussions are part of what we are seeing now. On one hand, he could have been hailed by the system for doing such a thorough job and even elevated. On another hand, he could have been um, removed to a calmer place. Mm -hmm a place where he would not uh, be in a position to do the same thing. Mind you, he's not the first commander of that operation. We've been, uh, we've been handling this thing for a very long time. And the videos that have been coming out have actually been coming out by what you call, uh, you know, the other ranks, uh, the junior mayors, uh, the core of the, uh, the, the battle itself. Uh, with charges against their commanders and so on. So mo most likely he went there uh, with a new zeal uh, to show the men that he was with them and he was doing everything possible, but probably did not get the proper uh, a briefing. Like I said, um, even if you look at the service chiefs, they don't just talk to the press because, uh, you know, they wrote a memo or they need certain things and they didn't get it. They, they take a little while to calm down and they talk when they must talk. Um, the information officer's job, like I said, is to pass, uh, break this thing down and pass it on to the public. Uh, these statistics, you know, of the number of vehicles, the number of tires and everything that have been lost that was given, I think is a lot uh, too damning for those who think he's superiors. I mean, while we appreciate the, you know, the explanation there of maybe the protocol or the manner in which the communication uh, was made, it's also clear to us that part of what he revealed there is the fact that the Boko Haram uh, seem clearly more equipped than they are. Uh, do you in any way think that this revelation or because of this video, uh, something would be done in terms of equipping our own you know, security personnel, our own soldiers uh, to be ready uh, for this battle? Well, you can see that, uh, you know, the, unless he's talking about getting a different kind of vehicle, uh, what he was complaining about really were, were a number of tires and all that they were using on the terrain. Um, the reality 
which I'm glad he mentioned, mm -hmm. is that the Boko Haram troops are not insurmountable. Uh, that came out clearly in his message. Uh, but the fact that something that should disturb us is how Boko Haram are being, uh, you know, are being equipped and re-equipped. This is a landlocked army um, surrounded on all sides by uh, nations that are part of the force that is fighting them. So this is what we really need to worry ourselves about. How are these people being equipped by some of this sophisticated equipment that cannot be airdropped? Uh, we've had cases of helicopters resupplying them with arms and food and so on. But these vehicles and so on, and so on cannot uh, just be airdropped in, in, the, in the jungle. They are being landed in airports in the, our so-called friendly countries. And these are the areas that I think governments should and intelligence agencies should work harder to figure out for us. Once we can get that, we can leave it at the board. There's no doubt that there are foreign powers, there are certain people who are interested in this war, uh, you know, going on and on for so long. And we need to ask questions exactly about what's happening. I rightly took that question out from my mouth, but I'll now ask you, what more should we expect and even push to see as an investigation into the conditions of our soldiers, you know, generally? Um, when you say we, are you talking about me and you or about the Nigerian army or about Nigerian Those who are responsible, the powers that be. Yeah, because you see, the, the powers that be are getting their information from the armed forces. Um, yes, the Office of the National Security Advisor is there, but the troops in the field and the intelligence information that we're, we're uh, getting for the real battle is coming from the troops themselves in the field. So um, I, I think we should just rely on the fact that the actual information is being received. You can see that one thing is clear, and from my experience while I was serving, if you want sophisticated equipment, you have to go through a long protocol. And that requires, let's say, Nigeria apply, applying to the United States government, United States talking to their, uh, you know, to, to their, their politicians, and getting approval for this kind of weapon to be released to Nigeria. Uh, it takes a very long process. Sometimes you you get an, you, you meet a, uh, a solid wall where approval is not given. Now, when it is given, they don't take it off the shelf. They have to produce them. And that's why you, you hear the Air Force talking about a two-year, three-year delivery time for something that has been paid for as of yesterday. Okay, But when you are dealing with uh, as Boko Haram, then you are getting everything through the back door. Um, and there are people who specialize in supplying equipment to this kind of agents because they make huge profits. And so the money is coming from somewhere and they're able to now move it through this back door and then get their equipment as at when they need it. This is the real problem. Thank you very much, Femi Gbadibo, retired Air Vice Marshal, for bringing expert insights to this matter this morning.